cave dwellers hunted the horse for food. But as humankind evolved, so did its relationship with the horse. Humans began to see the horse as a noble creature, a loyal servant, and a true companion. And so it has been. For 5,000 years, the horse running with us through different lands and civilizations, through time and experience. Today, the services of the horse have been greatly diminished, but the bond between horse and human has never been stronger. Join us as we examine this fascinating relationship in a six-part series, The Horse. I've been over there, Michael Jump right there, so you classically Horse people. Riders, breeders, doctors, and just plain uncomplicated, unapologetic horse lovers. For some people, horses are a profession or a business. For others, a hobby. And for untold numbers of people, horses are simply a fascination they cannot resist. Since I can remember, I've been getting on horses, like I think the first time I had diapers on. I do all things Clydesdale. Basically speaking, if somebody asks me, I usually say yes. If you've got a good horse, well trained, I can't say enough about the horse, the different things it can do. People like to ride horses because they can overcome the limits that, that being human puts on them. Join us as we meet some special people. Special because of their unique, passionate, and undeniable connection to the animal we call the horse. Welcome to the largest indoor agricultural fair and equestrian show in the world. The Royal Agriculture Winter Fair in Toronto, Canada. Here is where you'll find hundreds and hundreds of horses and thousands of horse lovers. This is the place to be surrounded by the sights, sounds and boundless energy of the world of horses. Horse people everywhere. Terry Elder is one. He's a professional. He breeds horses. And you can tell he's right in his element today. The gypsy horse was bred by the Romani people of the UK, for Scotland, England, Ireland. They were bred to pull their, their wagons. They were travelers. They, they never stayed in one place. So they bred a horse that was fairly strong in stature and also colorful and quiet, the, the three things that they needed. So ended up with a horse with lots of mane and tail and feather to be flashy when it was going down the road as they were pulling their home and also was strong enough to pull a big home if there was lots of children and also had to be quiet at night because they pulled over, they'd have a campfire, maybe have a few beers and a lot of times the children were ended up looking after the horses so they didn't want a big horse that was wild in any way so it had to be quiet. Terry raises an interesting topic. The Romani are actually a horse people. In other words, horses were and still are in some places so central to the Romani culture that it earns them the name horse people. But Terry's not here for a history lesson. He's got a horse he wants people to know about. 
a lot of times we get people never seen one before and want to learn a lot about them. So it's important for us as breeders, because we're obviously trying to sell youngsters and, and breed as many as we can. So to do that, we have to do a good job of exposing them to the public, uh, telling them the good qualities they have, why they would like to own a horse, and why particularly they like to own this breed. So how did Terry get to be a horse person? My grandpa had a farm and he had a couple work horses and I spent the summer with my grandpa and worked with him and it was just a seed that was in there and then later in life we sold our business a couple years ago and then it was a passion to do something and strive to do it as best as I could. A big horse event like this one is just what Terry needs to apply the professional guidelines he works by. I think a, a good breeder, whatever breed you're in, is to find the best quality of horse that represents the breed, whatever they may be, whether it's size, bone size, shoulder, stay true to that. Don't breed to what you would like, especially with a stallion, because you may breed them to many different mares. Try to get the best you can. As a professional breeder, you'd think Terry would be too thick-skinned about his work to become attached to any one horse. After all, a sale is a sale. But he's not immune to the regret he feels when the time comes to let a good horse go. In breeding, it's a little harder because you know you're ultimately selling them. So in the back of your mind, you realize that they will go. There's some horses, Tom Tom, similar to that, where he's just a quiet fellow, easy to be around, easy to work with. It is hard. harder. It would be harder to let him go no matter what they offer you for him. There's a point where you just you love him around, he's a part of your life really, and, and that's the way it is. And, and some others you don't mind getting rid of, they're just not like that, eh? So you do get attached, you work with them every day, you're up in the barn at five o'clock every morning, you go to, you know, you go in from the barn at night, at dark, you know, so you wouldn't do that unless you enjoy doing it, really. Needless to say, Terry's not the only one doing business at the horse show. It's a real opportunity to connect and catch up on the latest horse news. We get together, and talk about something I may not know, something they may not know, and just pick up tin bits and just how generally it's going in the horse world, and that's a great social thing for us. As long as there are horses, there will be horse shows. This one takes us to Nova Scotia and the Maritime Fall Fair where horse lovers turn out in droves to soak up everything that looks or smells like a horse. Nothing like the aroma of a horse-worn barn to stir up that youthful sense of excitement and vitality. And of course there are the ones who come for the shopping. Nice Nags is the name of Shauna Johnson's tackle shop. She sells tackle and everything else to keep a horse happy. Or more to the point, to keep a horse owner happy. You get different varieties of customers. You get your backyard. You know, I love my horse. It's in my backyard. I don't do much with it, but I'll buy a brush or a bucket or a treat. And then you've got some of the ones that are more, more into it. And they're buying blankets and saddles. Shauna is not in this just for the money. She couldn't stay away from horses if she tried. In fact, she's got her own back in New Brunswick, and that keeps her busy in addition to her retail business and bringing up kids. A horse is a seven day a week, 24 hour a day. It's almost like a job. By the time I get my kids up in the morning and take them to daycare or school, I'm in the barn, I go in the barn till about 12, I go into town, I go to work, I come back, I have supper, put the kids to bed, and I'm back in the barn again. I'm, my days are full right from first thing in the morning till when I do night check at 10 o'clock at night. You have to be very a loving, compassionate person to care. And you have to love it to do it. And I know I'm going to be with it till I've already got my daughter her own pony. <laughs> Now for some horse people who are here at the show for the pure enjoyment of sharing their love of horses with their adoring fans. These are the Canadian Cowgirls. Terry Jenkins is the founder and leader of this rodeo-style precision riding team from Chatham, Ontario. She's the one who inspires young female horse lovers from across the country to saddle up and hit the road with her performing for enchanted rodeo audiences everywhere. We're dazzling women and their horses who perform daring maneuvers 
in a patriotic fashion. To listen to Terry Jenkins talk about how they got started, you realize you're talking to a special kind of horse person. She's what you might call a horse dreamer. We ran into a gentleman who was putting on an event called the Can-Am Show. And he told me that they had an American drill team coming up, but they really were trying to get a Canadian drill team to work with them. So I said, well, I have a drill team, but I really didn't. <laughs> so that night in the hotel room, they're all saying, what did you tell him you had a drill team for? I said, because we can do this. We figured it all out that night. We did what it takes. We did all we had to do to make us the best that we could be. The Canadian cowgirls are a big success. They've been a hit at some pretty big events. We've had the privilege of performing at the Kentucky Derby Parade where we won best mounted unit there two years in a row. We've been at the Indy 500 Parade. We've also been at the Calgary Stampede where we won the best mounted unit out of 850 entries. No wonder Terry's vibrant spirit and positive attitude rubs off on her team members. And team members they have to be to make the show the success that it is. To become a Canadian cowgirl, you have to be a good rider, have your own horse, and be available to practice and to travel. We have a lot of discipline in our unit. This is not our career, this is our hobby. They all volunteer their time, they all volunteer their horses, and we go on the road, we do get a small fee for performing, but that covers all of our expenses to go down the road. Sometimes, we gotta do a lot of fundraising and sponsorships as well. So these skilled precision riders are volunteers. They do it for the pure satisfaction and enjoyment of performing with their horses and sharing that with the young people who come out to see them all over the country. How did Terry first connect with horses? Like so many horse professionals, Terry started young. When my mom brought me home from the hospital, my dad had a pony in the front room waiting for me. I must have gotten bitten by a horse fly because I've had horse fever ever since. And her childhood memories probably connect with the joy she gets from seeing the kids' response to the cowgirls and their horses every time they mount up and do their show. Children just love the Canadian cowgirls and they aspire to be like them. And so that's very important that our girls give that role model image. We're thrilled to be here in Halifax, aren't we, Ty? Yeah, we're happy to come here. <laughs> And what young girl wouldn't want to be a part of a sporting group like the Canadian Cowgirls? We have a lot of fun traveling and uh, no better way to travel than with our best friends, our horses. The racetrack. For centuries, even in the days of chariots, crowds have cheered their favorite horse and rider across the finish line. Horse person and champion jockey Chantal Sutherland hears the roar of the crowd from her perch atop some of the fastest horses in the business. It all started with a horse-loving father and a couple of ponies. My life is totally horse racing 24-7. I started racing um, eight years ago, but my father was the one who first involved me in horse racing. He was an owner and he had thoroughbreds and standardbreds and uh, he bought myself and my sister a couple of ponies and that's how I started with horses. And now she's a top prize winner in her field. But she doesn't take it for granted. She works hard to stay on top. I think in order to become a great rider, and I still myself am working at becoming a better rider every day, I think it's important to have balance and strength and not just any kind of strength. Your fitness as a jockey is second to none. The type of training that we do is intense and you really have to have the willpower to continue and get better and better and, and make yourself fitter and fitter. I work out at the gym, uh, I bench, I do a lot of uh, circuit training. I not only do the horses in the morning, but I work with a trainer. I, I race in the afternoons. On my days off, I climb the Mount Wilson and we walk up at some of the jockeys and we run down. Constantly working on your fitness, um, eating as healthy as possible, and just getting stronger and stronger and stronger. You can tell this is one horse person who knows what she wants, and she knows she has to be in top physical shape all the time. Her kind of racing is as physical as it gets. 
Physical fitness pays off, but she also has to be mentally and emotionally fit. This is a dangerous sport. For me, with fear, I, uh, I sense it more when I get close to the gate when we're getting ready for the race. And I either talk to myself about it and pray about it, and it's gone, and then I ride, it's fine. Earning good money and being a racetrack star must be pretty gratifying for a young woman like Chantel. But what really counts for her is what happens right there on the track, on the horse, in the moment, with the thunderous sound of hooves and the pounding of hearts as horse and rider charge across the finish line. It's the most incredible feeling. It's just so powerful. It's like nobody can stop you. You're just, just the fastest out there. And when you win, it's not only excitement, but it's like like a wash of like, I did it. And you feel like uh, relief too, as much as exciting. It's like, yeah, that's a relief. Chantal shares a pretty dramatic career with her horses and remains a force to be reckoned with on the racetrack. Back at the Maritime Fall Fair, we meet another horse person whose work is perhaps not high action, but still totally satisfying and, of course, full of horses. We're very pleased to have judging our draft horses this year. Marion Young is a horse show judge. From Hanover, Ontario, Marion Young. I'm actually a third generation Clydesdale person and I've been to South America and to Australia judging as well as all across North America. Marion has spent her life with Clydesdales. These Clydesdales are strutting their stuff for this internationally renowned Clydesdale connoisseur. Her job is to inspect each one and award first, second and third prizes. Her decision means a lot to Clydesdale breeders and others who travel the show circuit to win top recognition among horse people across the country and into the US. When you consider the number of horses Marion must see in the run of a judging season alone, you'd think it would be next to impossible for even the best Clydesdale to impress her. Not so. Every once in a while when you're judging, you see one that just makes your mouth water. You go, oh, wow, isn't that really great? You know, that's got all the bits and parts and pieces that I'm looking for. But most of them have flaws of some sort. And it's a case of prioritizing your decisions as to, is this flaw less important than that flaw? Because they all have flaws. And she has her own farm in Ontario, and its stables are not exactly empty. In 1982, I bought a farm in Ontario and I lived there in that area from 1982 until 2003 when I moved to Hanover. I have about 18 or 19 Clydesdales at home which are my own. I breed them and I also raise and train young ones and, and sell them. Uh, I also show prep horses for other people and for sales like if you are in a situation where you've got some horses to get ready for sale or a show and don't have the time or help to get it done, you can send them to my place and I'll do that for you. Or if you're in the situation where you have mares to foal and don't have the experience or the time or whatever, I'll do that for you. I do all things Clydesdale. Marion's enthusiastic but sensible approach to judging Clydesdale horses has won her respect among horse owners across North America and beyond. They're able to stay in touch with her through another project of hers, The Clydesdale Speculator, a publication she began in 2003. I also try to cover a little bit of non-Clydesdale stuff. I have gained quite a number of subscribers that are not Clydesdale people. They could be Belgian people, Portrait people. I even have some standard bred racehorse people that subscribe. It seems editing a horse publication, you get a good idea of how much horse lovers like to keep informed and in touch regardless of their breed of horse. Marion's publication is only one of hundreds of periodicals ranging from homemade newsletters to high-priced glossy magazines, all aimed at horse lovers in Canada, the US and the world. The number of readers worldwide is staggering and includes everybody from admiring teenage girls to dyed-in-the-wool horse professionals. Just another reminder of the huge numbers of human beings regularly keeping informed and entertained by horse information and horse images. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. 
The internet hosts hundreds of thousands of horse sites connecting millions of horse lovers all over the planet. Bronco riding. When it comes to horse entertainment, it doesn't get much more exciting than this. Horse people everywhere. Riders, handlers, and wide-eyed spectators. And behind the scenes, other people like Sylvain Bourgeois. He's a businessman. He makes all this happen. Organizing events all over the world and even developing and training horses for this and other rodeos. Horses are second nature to Sylvain. My dad always had horses and since I can remember, uh, I've been getting on horses. Like, I think the first time I had diapers on. So horses, yes. But how does a boy from Quebec end up making his living at the rodeo? My dad barrel raced for a living. Now he's retired, but that's mostly what we did until I was like 15. Then I had my first taste of rodeo. I saw my first rodeo and I fell in love with it. And then from that day, uh, that's all I've been doing, rodeoing. He loves his job. It's a big one. The costs alone could easily spoil the fun. It costs a lot of money, a lot and lot of money. By the time we figure uh, a bucking horse is ready to, to go on the road to bigger rodeos, we've got at least like 7,000 invest in them. And then by the time they're like really, really, really to go to a bigger rodeo, then you can talk about $15,000. Like the personality of a horse, that's what makes him really good or really bad for cowboys, like some of them, like we say a horse are mean. Yeah, some of them are mean. Some of them are just gentle and cowboy friendly, we call them. The cowboys, they, 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 we got different cowboys too. Some cowboys, they're scared of nothing. Other cowboys, they don't want to get on your rank horses, like they call them. They want to get on the hopper, which is like a just jump and kick, just nice kind of horse. The rank horse would be like to the left, to the right, kick, no kick, turn around, hard to ride. Sylvain started out as a rider and moved up to management. He's not out there on the Bronx anymore, but he's not finished being a cowboy either. He'll take whatever the job brings. I guess I was really fortunate to, throughout all the horse I got on through my careers uh, to not have anything serious happen to me. But it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. We still work with horses all the time in the back pens, loading them, and some of them are means. See, last summer I got kicked in the chest and broke three ribs, and this is part of rodeo, and I've been doing it all my life, and then we live with it. It's like part of rodeo and part of being a cowboy. Far away from rodeos and horse shows, a centuries-old family potato patch in Newfoundland still gets harvested every summer. Meet the Colburn brothers, Eric and Jim. Neither is a professional horse person. They just do their bit to pay homage to the tradition of the family working horse in the place where they grew up. This potato plot goes back to the 18th century. My great-grandfather, he used it. My grandfather, my father, and now us. They know they don't really need a horse anymore for such a modest harvest of potatoes. But doing it this way, the horse makes a special link with their past. We're basically using the horse the same way we did that our fathers and grandfather used. Up until this past, what, I suppose, probably 10 years, we hauled out of our firewood with the horse. I know uh, we've traveled uh, five, six miles in the country just to haul wood. If you wanted to go out to the town to pick up supplies, groceries, whatever, you'd uh, tackle up the horse and that was your transportation. It was a part of almost everyday activity. Like any family in this area, when Jim and Eric were boys, there was a family horse, a Newfoundland pony. We had one named Queen, yeah. It was a little mare. It was a great little workhorse. Great for pulling wood. I was probably six, seven years old. Every day, my father would harness it up to the cart, and uh, I used to love to go for a ride. Eh? 
You can still hear that boyhood pride when they talk about Jim's present horse. This horse is a halfling or breed. I bought it about three years ago. It's six years old. It's well trained. It's great for plowing. I have great respect for the horse in that, you know, the amount of work that it can do. And, uh, and if you've got a good horse, well trained, I can't say enough about the horse, the different things it can do. And like I say, if you've got a good one, it's a real plus. She's a great horse and it gets me out of the house too. Eh? So uh, it's a great hobby. We always had horses and I think I always will. <laughs> Horse people come in all sizes. Six-year-old Emily Nichols has been riding her pony Skipper since the age of three. Because once I got used to him, then I knew he wasn't going to, like, step on me or something. Even Emily's mom, Cindy, has trouble remembering a time in her daughter's life without horses. We can't remember a time when she hasn't loved horses. Even as a baby, it seemed like the books about horses, the toys with horses, that's what she's always loved. Her affection for her horse withstood even a few falls. When I was little, I was riding with a girl, and she was riding on a horse named Shy, and I was riding on Skipper, and um, two of us fell off. I bit my tongue, and like my tongue started bleeding, and <laughs> by the next day it was all right and it hasn't dampened her enthusiasm for riding or for spending time in Skipper's barn. But she knows it's not always fun and games with Skipper. He gets lots of attention and affection. He also needs chores done, and he needs to be able to rely on people, including Emily. Emily knows that it's just not her. You know, her choices, you know, affects Skipper as well, so she can't, some days she would like to play Barbies all day long, but there is times when she has to come and do some work as well. Sometimes she like have to clean the stall if you're putting it in the barn, and the stalls are really dirty. Another thing you would have to do is like, if it's pens like, no grass like it is right here now, you would have to take it out and like, put it in another pen. I can't remember. Will Emily be among the all-familiar droves of teenage girls who populate riding stables and sign up for dressage training and fill their lives with horse books and horse clothes and everything horse they can lay their hands on? Will she one day be a competitive rider? Maybe take it on full time? Or maybe in a few years she'll lose interest and just drop it all? Her mother ponders the question. I I'm just glad that she has the pony right now that she can have a friendship with and ride as she wants and have fun with. She's only six. She has her teenage years to go through that yet, and a lot of girls at 13 and 14 aren't so interested in their horses anymore. So I, we'll see. Uh, I'm a horse lover myself, so there will always be horses here for Emily to enjoy. Whether she chooses to go further in it, time will tell, I guess. A whole future ahead of her to be with horses in whatever way she chooses. She's off to a good start with a good friend. Meet two friends who have made a lifelong bond with each other through their work with horses. Horses have been in Kathy's life for a long time. Her love for the animals started with a picture hanging on her grandmother's wall. And it was the picture of a little girl and her pony. And I could sit on those stairs and stare at that for ages. I was so jealous of that little girl. And I wanted a pony just like that. And I was only maybe three or four. It wasn't too long after that she sat on a horse for the first time. And I remember I was wearing a little pink dress. And my father hoisted me up on the back of this Clydesdale. The horses' names, I still know them, I'm 55. <laughs> and at five years of age, I remember there were Barney and Bessie and Rosie and Ross, a team of four beautiful big Clydesdales. And once I got up there, boy, you couldn't get me down. 
My father had an awful time to get me off that horse. The feeling of the warmth of their body on my legs, the fact that they were such gentle giants. I just knew that I had a passion for these animals and that I was going to devote a lot of time and energy to getting my own horse. Over the years, Kathy has done a lot for horses. She's taken in a number of neglected horses, put a roof over their head, nursed them back to health, then found good homes for them. But something was missing. Kathy wanted a horse to call her own. One that she could not only ride, but one that would also become her companion. My vet said to me, Kathy, you're always picking up strays. Why don't you get yourself a really good riding horse that hasn't been abused. And that's how I found Destry. And she's half Clydesdale. I saw her like father, beautiful big child. black Clyde from PEI. Yeah, and her mother was part Newfoundland pony and part Morgan. And well, this was 22 years ago. And I knew that I would want a horse that I could still ride in my 50s. I'm going to have a big, thick winter coat this year, my dear. Kathy puts no limitations on her affection and admiration for her horse. What horses do for me, they do for a lot of people. There are people who just get on their horse and take off in the woods and ride hard and come home and throw them out in the field. But you'll find, especially a lot of women in this barn and other barns, even when they're not riding, they just want to be with their horse, like I am today. Horses are very spiritual creatures, and they can sense your moods. Destry being a mare, when she goes in heat sometimes, she has her little moods. But we have a bond that nobody else has. The love she gives me is unconditional, and the fun I have with her, it's a little piece of heaven. And I can honestly tell you that if illness or something like that prevents me from, from coming here for a week or so, I start getting this knot in my stomach. Like, I have to get out here and see my horse, even though I have a friend who will take care of her for me. And I, I have to get out here and spend time with her, even if it's only fooling around like this. Linda Turk is a teacher. Riding students across North America seek her out to be their mentor. She's an expert in dressage, a long-respected approach to promoting obedience and athletic ability in horses being trained in the English tradition. Lynn takes her inspiration from the oldest of sources. I just finished reading a translation from the original Greek of Xenophon, one of the great philosophers who also wrote the very first book on horsemanship. And his dressage theory is pretty much as it is today. He talks in his book about nutrition and diet, um, exercise, hoof care, type of saddlery, bits. Um, he talks about the most attractive way for a young man to vault onto his horse, can or cannot use the spear. And it's just very interesting to see that the ideas that, that he supported back then are still good ideas now. Lynn's lessons can be hypnotic for the observing student. She knows the relationship between horse and rider in its finest detail. What you need to look for is you need to look down at the top of the horse. You need to know that the rectangle starts at the horse's head, ends at the horse's haunch and tail, and that it goes along the sides of the horse. So that horse has to balance within the parameters of the rectangle and stay vertical. Now the rectangle can bend, the horse's body will bend in some of the movements, but you can't have the horse leaning one way or another, tipping forward onto its forehand, or balking or backing unless it's asked to because actually, and this is a really technical little dressage thing, the back is a forward movement. 
you ride the horse forward to the bit and then the horse backs from the bit. So it's a forward movement. But all of that is within the parameters of that rectangle. Although she speaks with the precision of an experienced rider and teacher, her introduction to dressage was bathed in fantasy and romance when she was just 14. I saw the Spanish Riding School on their first world tour. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis brought them to the United States for the first time. And I was a hunt seat rider, and I saw those Lipizzaner stallions and those riders, and I said, I'm going to do that. If I don't do anything else with my life, I'm going to do that. So I've spent years and years and years learning dressage. And after all that time, it's still not all discipline and control between Lynn and her horse. Lynn and Zoe have a personal relationship built on affection and understanding. She's a very sweet horse. She's exactly like she was when she was born, which was practically a lap puppy. She's very nice to work around on the ground. She has impeccable ground manners. The only time she has ever really misbehaved was last winter when the snow was sliding off the roof and then I got dumped a couple times, but it was a fright situation. She's a little bit stubborn. Her mom is real stubborn. So every once in a while she will decide that um, her priorities are more important than ours during a, during a riding session. You get, a, you get a mix, but usually, you know, she's a very sweet horse. And she drinks coffee. I try not to give her too much coffee. I give her a couple little handfuls. She likes it black. For some people, horses are their work. For others, horses are just a part of who they are. For Megan Woodland, it's a chosen lifestyle. She's a professional horse person, a veterinarian. While Megan's profession brings her in close contact with horses, her deepest connections with them are on a personal level. Well, I've been riding horses since a very young age. I've always uh, loved horses, and I've always wanted to be a veterinarian in general. But over the last 10 years being around horses, I really decided that that's what I love to do. As a professional horse doctor and horse owner, Megan takes care of a horse's every need, including its medical needs. I think it's more being close to horses, being around horses. I think the science part of it is not that much different from other species necessarily, but I like the contact with horses and horse owners. There is courses you can take in equine behavior, we call it, and that's looking at all the different things that horses do and explains why they do them the certain way they do and, and how to help horses that have behavior problems. Most times with the horses, and especially in this area of the province, we see generalized you know, physical exams, annual consults, where we do overall well-being for the horse. We take care of their teeth, we give them their vaccinations, we make sure they're healthy. Otherwise, you can see horses for a variety of reasons. Sometimes you'll see them because they're on sound or they're lame, and we need to look and see if there's anything wrong with them, if they've hurt themselves, and that kind of thing. As well, you see horses when they're ill, and when they're ill, sometimes they can have colic, which is an abdominal pain in a horse, which can be for many different reasons. That's usually an emergency we see. And then we also see things such as cuts that we have to suture up, that kind of thing. It all depends when you're looking at nutrition of a horse, what their intended use is. So what kind of exercise they do, what kind of lifestyle they lead. It's very different feeding a horse that's a pasture companion than it is a horse that's expected to perform fairly heavily. So we always first look at that. And then mainly the number one thing that we recommend is a good quality roughage. So to have good top quality hay or good quality pasture grass for them to graze on. And then after that, depending on their exercise use, we look at supplementing them with grains. I have two horses. The horse on the right is a Palomino three-year-old quarter horse mare, and her name is Cadence. The black horse is a 15-year-old Hanoverian mare whose name is Lise, and I bought her about 11 years ago from the RCMP auction in Ontario. They really like each other. They're getting along very well. They haven't had any fights yet at all, so I'm very pleased with that. Veterinarians often have a special bond with horses a certain sense of what the horse is feeling. Throughout history, this horse sense was passed on through generations of horse people. There's a figure of speech from the old days. So-and-so had plenty of horse knowledge, and horse sense. I don't know that that figure of speech is in use anymore. Unfortunately, there aren't many people around now who have a lot of horse knowledge. Dr. Fraser is a person knowledgeable in what is known as horse sense. 
He has written many widely regarded books on horses and horse people. One such book, Founding Horses, highlights an oath horse people were required to take in order to be inducted into the Horse Society of Scotland. I, of my own free will and accord, solemnly vow and swear before God and all these witnesses that I will heal, conceal and never reveal any part of the true horsemanship which I am about to receive at this time. That is the oath used for the induction of a, a new member to the Horseman's Fraternity in Scotland. Furthermore, I vow and swear that I will never give it nor see it given to a tradesman of any kind except a blacksmith or a veterinary surgeon or a horse soldier. Those who worked with horses on farms weren't recognised as being in a trade, but they formed a fraternity, you might say a union. And uh, this was the uh, induction, a secret word, secret oath. Furthermore, I will never give it, nor see it given to a fool, nor a madman, nor to my father, nor mother, sister, nor brother, nor any womankind. The oath proclaimed special powers over horses, similar to what people nowadays call a horse whisperer. By doing so, they had a unity together and gave themselves uh, information and advice, because it was really a very exacting trade, working with horses, being plowmen and so on. As well as being a historian with a strong interest in horses, Dr. Fraser is also a well-respected veterinarian, having trained in Scotland and Canada. I wanted to become a horse doctor. So when I became a, a working vet myself, I was obliged to do most of my work relating to farm animals. But I, I still got to deal with horses now and then, and I enjoyed that part of it most. I always owned horses, ponies in particular, on the side. At one time, uh, I had 22 uh, ponies. Three of them were Highland ponies, and the rest were um, Shetland ponies and my wife complained, with justification I'm sure, that I was spending more time with the ponies than I was with my family. I have a high regard for the equine species. They don't kill each other. They're not cruel to each other. They may fight, but often the fight is just a bluff. A serious fight seldom occurs. Stallions are known to kill foals on very rare occasions for reasons incomprehensible, but by and large is a peaceable animal, sociable animal. I'm not sure that the human species can make that claim. Work or personal attachment, either way there's no mistaking the bond between horse people and their horses. People like to ride horses because they can overcome the limits that, that being human puts on them. They're, they're limited in their activity, and horses allow them a greater freedom of movement, and it it's, can be very spiritual. We have a bond that nobody else has. I've been involved with horses since I'm a kid, and this is part of my life, and I've visited most of the world doing it. We're really happy with what we're doing. We always had horses, and I think I always will. As long as there are horses, there will always be horse people.